want to welcome you again to our second installment of the Journey Smarter in September series. My name is Kelly Robert and I'm the Journey Program Manager and the Outreach Manager at Union Bank, which is part of the marketing department. And they both said not to do this, but I'm going to anyway. Two of my colleagues have been instrumental in helping to execute this series, and that's Caitlin Moore, the Financial Literacy Manager, and um, Nikki Davison, who is a coordinator in the marketing department. And we couldn't do this without them. So I'd like to thank them very much. I'd also really like to thank all of you for taking time from this rainy day when you could be doing something else to join us. I guarantee you're not gonna be disappointed. And we have Megan McGuffey, the Executive Director from Community Crops. And I've seen Megan present. She's amazing. And when we were putting this together, I had the opportunity to chat with Megan a bit via email. And this is the whole premise of this series are things that are seemingly unrelated topics that the people want to get better at. And to plan that, we kind of went a step further and that's what are you doing more of? Well, you're drinking coffee, you're cleaning up your house, you're doing you know, all these things and one of them People I was talking to are planning these massive gardens, or they're like me, they're cooking up a storm, and so they're shopping at the farmer's market. And Megan and I were talking about how people, there's all this abundance, but then what do you do with it? And also, what are some alternatives to, to planning your own garden? So I'm going to just just hand it over to her, let her tell you, to answer some of these questions and for your questions send them to Caitlin and Megan can expand on them so thanks so very much well thank you for that lovely introduction I'm, I'm really glad to be with you all today so hopefully let me know if there's any issues with seeing my screen but uh, I will go ahead and get started so yeah, today we're going to talk about how to make the most of your local harvest and that's both in your own backyard but also how to make the most of your harvest um, from other sources, such as our local farmers. So I thought I would start out by giving you a little bit more information about my organization, Community Crops. Our mission is to provide education, advocacy, and experiences to grow local food. And we do that through a variety of programs. We manage 11 community gardens across the city of Lincoln, and those gardens are rentable plots to anyone in Lincoln who applies on a sliding scale basis based on income. Uh, we also do education for all ages and we really do, we start with toddlers growing their own food and learning to eat healthy from the garden. Uh, but we cover things like gardening, cooking, and sustainable living topics with our own staff and with a variety of partners who help us out. We also have a Prairie Pines training farm. This is a five acre space where we allow new farmers to start their businesses. So we provide them with resources and land access, technical assistance, all in that effort to sort of help them get their businesses going. And in particular, we're really proud of our work with the Yazidi Farmers Project. This is an ethnic minority from Northern Iraq. And there's a wonderful immigrant community in Lincoln from the Yazidi people, and uh, they are at our farm with us and growing food for sale and really kind of creating the products that their own community wants, which is wonderful. We've also got a production greenhouse. So some of you might have heard of our annual plant sale that we usually have in the spring um, that has seedlings for your garden as well as native plants. But that greenhouse is also really important because it lets us grow plants that we give away to our low to moderate income gardeners. And it's also rentable space for our beginning farmers because creating your own greenhouse or building your own is very expensive. So it's a nice way to help people get started. And then with all of this wonderful produce, it has to go somewhere. So we do a few different types of vegetable sales. One is the Union Bank and Trust Veggie Van. Every week it's at the F Street Farmers Market during the season. And then it also pops up at special events. And we've got a new storefront at our office at 11th and B. And we love our vegetable sales because it's a way of giving our, far, our beginning farmers a market for their products, but we also are able to keep it affordable for our community members by doing things like accepting food stamps and participating in programs like Double Up Food Bucks. 
I also like to share a little bit of the why, why we do what we do and why we think it's so important. And for me, it all boils down to food security. And I like to think of that in two different ways. There's sort of the community level and also the individual or household level. So on an on a individual level, there are still people that are hungry in Lincoln. It's, it's not something we like to think about and it's really sad, but um, you know, there's people that don't know where their next meal are coming from, is coming from, or they're maybe having to make hard trade-offs between do I pay my rent or do I provide a diverse, you know, healthy diet for my family? And so having gardens, having spaces where people can grow and preserve more of their own food is an important part of helping families in Lincoln be more food secure. Uh, there's also the fact at a community level that uh, Nebraska doesn't grow food. And that's kind of a, a maybe a shocking statement. But if you take our most famous crop corn, the Nebraska Corn Board will tell you that about 99% of that is not used by humans. It's feed for livestock or fuel. And so really what we're all about here is saying, you know, especially in a year like this, that where we've had all of these disruptions, we realize that food supply can be kind of fragile. And so when we support local farmers, we grow our local food system, it's a great way of building community resilience and putting redundancies into the system so that we have more of our own healthy food. And in addition to that, you know, better agricultural practices for all, we build our natural resources and we teach people and give them opportunities to garden and farm in a way that helps nature. And there's just so many economic and cultural benefits of a thriving local food system. And I think we'll talk about some of that today. But if you go to your local farmer's market or you support a local restaurant where the chef is purchasing from farmers, there's something really special and it kind of creates an, an identity and improves the quality of life for our community. So I think that's something we, we all want to invest in. So thanks for uh, learning a little bit more about our organization. I want to dive into the content now. So First of all, I wanna talk a little bit about your options outside of your garden for accessing local food. Uh, and then we'll dive into more about how to preserve the harvest wherever it's coming from. And then a few tips on fall gardening if we've got time. So there's lots of different ways to enjoy local produce. And I just wanna highlight some of the big ones. First are the farmer's markets in Lincoln. We're very lucky in this community. We have a farmer's market almost every day of the week and I've kind of listed them here. With any of these, I always recommend you go to their website or their social media pages because they're constantly updating and changing, especially in a year like this, you know, when their hours of operation and their dates of operation are. But most of them go well into October and you, you can really kind of, I, I would encourage you to just shop around and try them out because they each have their own sort of different mix of vendors. They have different entertainment options and, and they're in different neighborhoods. So they all kind of have a unique character that's really nice. and you can find the one that's a good fit for you, in addition to them just being at different times, different dates. So that's a huge help. If you're a little nervous getting back out there, because I know safety is a big concern this year, I will say all the farmers markets are doing a really nice job. Uh, in particular, if you're sort of dipping your toe back in, the Sunday farmers market has one-way traffic and they're publishing their list of vendor locations as well as the products in advance. So you can really plan your trip and get through there quickly and safely. Retail is obviously the way most of us get the majority of our food. And so when you're at your grocery store, look for local labeling. I've included the Buy Fresh by Local um, logo down in the corner here. And that's one of the big signs of local products from our region, but every store kind of tends to have their own branding strategy as well. So what I would really just say is ask a lot of questions. Tell the stores that you want local food. You know, they're a competitive market. So they wanna give people the products they're interested in. So just give them the information and um, help support your local farmer by encouraging your stores to stock their products. And I would just have to plug our, our storefront at 11th and B, um, and especially with UBT support, you can get a nice bag with their logo on it this year. So that's just another way you can buy farm, um, farm fresh food directly from our beginning entrepreneurs. There are some less known ways that you can shop local that are kind of fun and interesting. The first one is a community supported agriculture. So if you've never experienced this before, it's kind of like a vegetable subscription service. So what you do is you form a relationship directly with a farm or a farmer and you say, hey, I want to put money in at the beginning of the season to help you do what you do, grow fantastic food. And then I will get that back as a share of food every week over the course of the season. 
And so it's a really nice way of investing in farmers, forming a relationship. And for those of us that are cooking a lot more and are just looking to stretch ourselves, it's a really great way of forcing yourself to be creative. You know, when we go to the store or we're growing in our own garden, we really focus narrowly on the things that we know we like and we're familiar with. But with a CSA, you get the best of the best, whatever's in season and coming off that farm at that moment. So sometimes you're going to get a basket full of kohlrabi and you're going to have to learn what that is and what you can cook with it. So it's, it's a really fun way of pushing yourself and your cooking skills. Uh, and I am mentioning this now because although the gardening season is winding down and the, and the growing season, uh, these were incredibly popular this year. I think just about every CSA subscription in town sold out. So if you think this is something that you'd like to try for next season, what I'd recommend is you start doing your research now, find the one you're interested in, get on their mailing list, and then when they open up their CSA subscription for next year, you'll be at the top of the list and you won't miss out. And I'll give you some links and information on how to access that later. Um, I also want to mention some of our online buying options. So we have what are known as kind of virtual food hubs, Lone Tree Foods and Nebraska Food Co-op in this state. And these are, they often work with large buyers like restaurants and grocery stores, but they can also be great for consumers. And so again, it's an online way that farmers list the products they have and what quantity and cost. And then you can buy it kind of in bulk and get it delivered or picked up somewhere. And so this is usually larger quantities, but if you think about it, you get a couple friends, couple neighbors together, you split up the case of something great like tomatoes or eggplants. This is a good way to go. It's also really nice if you're trying to can or something like that to get those larger quantities. And the last thing I wanna mention on kind of unusual sales approaches is we actually do have produce ready in Nebraska well into the winter months. Our farmers are really savvy. They use different season extension methods. And so you can actually enjoy this harvest well into the fall and winter. And one of the ways you can do that is the Holiday Harvest Farmers Market. These are four special farmers markets in November so that you can even have local products featured in your holiday meals. Um, and I did see that it's gonna be outdoors this year. So that's a way of kind of allowing yourself to be safe and also access those products. So it's a lot of information, a lot of spaces that you can get local food. And I just want to mention a couple resources as well. Uh, there's a new Facebook group called Healthy and Fit Families at the Market. And it's a fun group that's a lot of extension and nutri nutrition professionals. And so they are every week going to the farmer's market, coming up with recipes and sharing what they're cooking. So sometimes it can be intimidating to try these new things or you're just fresh out of ideas. So that's a great group to be in to learn from each other. And then the Buy Fresh, Buy Local Nebraska website, which I have a screenshot of here, is also a really good resource. So if you're looking for a CSA and you wanna meet some farmers, they've got a list on there. If you're trying to get more information on those specific farmers markets I mentioned, great place to go. You can also see what's in season and get recipe ideas for those new products you might be trying. Okay, so that's all about the other ways that you can um, access local food. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about how you can preserve that harvest and so you have that taste of the garden well into the, the gloomy winter months. So I'm gonna kind of hit on a high level, three different um, procedures for preserving food. And I just wanna reinforce that with all of these, food safety is the most important thing. And I'll give you some resources at the end on how to do that, but you really want to use stuff that is at its peak. You don't want to use any produce that's not really looking its best. And you want to follow all the appropriate procedures for that method to keep yourself safe and enjoy that good food. So the first one I want to talk about is freezing. This is kind of my go-to. I, I love canning, but I don't always have the time to do the whole setup. So this is a way, you know, I've got a deep freeze. It's a great way if you have the space to, to preserve a lot of food and have it be quick and accessible. So with herbs, you can do things like, um, it's really simple to just kind of clean them, chop them up and add a liquid component to freeze them. Typically either water or, or like an olive oil. Uh, blanching is another thing that I use quite frequently. This is useful for most vegetables. Really you're kind of trying to create that chemical change where you start the cooking process, stop the growing process, and then you very quickly end the cooking process by cooling it off so that the produce kind of stays at its pre peak in frozen form. And the cooking times vary, but it's really a quick boil and then a dunk in an ice bath. 
So um, look it up because every, every item is a little bit different as far as the cooking time, but it's, it's usually only like two minutes or less. So very quick method. With any of these, I just want to mention you're trying to minimize air exposure. So packing them really tightly in whatever container they're in, removing air by one method or the other is really helpful. Um, and I also just want to caution you from my own personal experience. Think a lot about how you're packaging these things for your future use. So I am just like the queen of like, oh, I got to make a big batch of pesto. I don't have a lot of time. And then I put it in this giant container. And then here's Megan in February trying to like break apart this like hockey puck of pesto when I only just needed a tiny bit. So um, I say that to say, you know, you can use ice cube trays. You can um, freeze things on cookie sheets or freeze them, kind of quickly freeze them in a muffin tin. So then you kind of already have the portion sizes that you know you want, and then you can always put it in a bigger container. But that will save you a lot of trouble when you're cooking, especially with like herbs and things. If it's too large of a block, it's going to be challenging to melt that and, and kind of start cooking it evenly. Hey, Megan, I have some questions that have come in. Yeah, please. Um, one of them is how do you, what would you, how do you recommend one get started in container gardening? So even the freezing process, is there like a certain fruit and vegetable that you would suggest if people are just getting warmed up to this process? Yeah. Um, and was that with growing or with um, pr preservation? Um, let's go with preservation. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, getting started. Uh, I think greens are really easy and it's, they're so forgiving because you can put them in soups, you can put them in smoothies. So that's a really easy place to start. And even late in the fall, you could be growing some of your own or get really great produce from the markets. Uh, they're also easy to grow in containers. So that's a good option too, to kind of maybe answer the question both ways. Um, and then herbs are really easy to grow in containers inside, um, get a big harvest. And it's a, it's an easy process. There's so many recipes out there. So those are some like kind of little places to get started. And then you can kind of work your way up if, if you're not experienced in this area. Awesome. And then another question, and you may get to this, so just we can hold off on it, but how do we get a public garden plot? Is that something? Oh, you great question. Yeah. So um, for our gardens, basically we have an application process. You can do it in person if you need to, or have us mail you an application, or it's always on our website. So we usually release that. Um, we do returning gardeners, I think around November, and then the new gardener application typically comes out in December. And so you fill out this information, uh, you kind of rank choice your top three gardens, and you can find all of our gardens on our website under the Community Gardens tab. There's a nice map there. Um, and then basically we try to place as many people as we can. We had a big waiting list this year, so definitely get your, your name in early. But yeah, and then it's on a sliding scale basis based on income. So it's a, it's a really nice way to meet your neighbors. And I didn't talk about this much earlier, but I mean, just the cultural exchange and seeing people's different traditions and the way they grow, even the same thing like a tomato, it's a really fun part of being in the gardens. You learn a lot and it's a great way to kind of safely connect with people outside. All right, I will continue, but feel free to jump in again with more questions. So I think we covered freezing pretty well. Um, so next, I'm gonna jump on to drying. So drying or dehydrating your, your produce. So um, you know, it varies a lot. Again, you'll, you'll hear this from me. It's kind of going to be a, a repeating frame, but, uh, refrain, but you, you just have to look up the specifics for your product because there's not a universal way to do this. But with herbs, things like sage, thyme, uh, rosemary, lavender, I typically uh, clip them, put them in a bundle kind of like you see here and hang them upside down. And, and the key is to keep your space dry and warm. And that's what allows it to, um, to, to successfully dry and be preserved properly. And again, you don't want to use any plants that are a little dodgy or diseased. Um, you don't want any moisture in there. So don't start with plants that are super wet. Um, those are sort, sort of the keys to being successful. Um, hot peppers, you can actually just kind of like thread through them, thread them on a string and hang them to dry. Again, keeping those warm, dry conditions. Um, and if you're pulling a lot of harvest out of the garden right now, things like onions or winter squash, uh, make sure you look up how to properly cure them because some of them can stay for a, quite a lot of months if you let the, the product cure. So you have to keep it in the right conditions 
so that the the skin can thicken and it's and it stays nice and it also matters you know keeping them away from sunlight keeping them in a cool space things like that are really important to kind of keeping them in their dormant state as long as possible uh, you can also use ovens on really low settings or a food dehydrator if you have a whole lot of things if you want to do things like sun-dried tomatoes or stuff like that uh, that can be a really great tool that's easy to use, but will really save you a lot of time. And then finally, canning. I wouldn't dare pretend to be an expert. I've done a lot of canning, but I mean, food safety, again, is just so important here. This is the greatest way if you want really long-term storage and really stable shelf life. And what I'm going to recommend with any of these methods, but especially with canning, is that you use your local extension office. They are an incredible resource. This website that I've linked here has so much information for all of these methods, not only on the step-by-step -step safety things, but also, you know, quantities, different mixes, all sorts of recipes. So it's a really great website. Um, and yeah, I mean, you can start really simple. Not everything has to be a big pressure cooker, scary thing. There's lots of um, easy entry canning things to do. So it's a really nice thing to try out. If you haven't already gotten your supplies this year, I will just warn you, I think everyone's been gardening this year and everyone's been canning this year. So I've heard the lids especially are really hard to find. So if you have a stash, you should use them because it's a, it's a rare commodity right now. So those are the basics of preservation and feel free to let me know if you have any questions. But uh, since we have some more time, I thought I would also talk a little bit about fall gardening and the things that you can be doing at home right now. So in case you don't know, um, we, we think about what to grow where based on hardiness zones. So we're in 5B in Nebraska. You've maybe seen this label on tags, especially for like landscape plants and perennials. But that basically kind of is a measure of our growing season and what kinds of plants can survive here. So in Nebraska, our first frost is typically in October and our last frost is typically in early April, or excuse me, late April. And I will say, I think there's always like a random May freeze. So this, these are just general guidance that are averages over many years, but you also have to watch the weather and be able to react quickly if things change. So as far as what you can plant in the fall, it's really everything you can plant in the spring. Um, things that like cooler weather, and even some things for next year. So garlic should be planted in October for a harvest next um, growing season. And just a few things to be aware of when you are growing in the fall, you've got shorter days, cooler temperatures, and they're not, that's not changing, right? Like in the spring, it's slowly getting warmer and warmer. The days are getting longer, but we have the opposite impact here in the fall. So you're going to have smaller plants, slower growth, but on the plus side, you're going to have fewer pests and less weeds. Uh, when selecting your varieties for the fall garden, especially now we're kind of getting near the, the end of planting time, you really want to look at maturity dates or harvest date on your seed packets. So these are a variety of seed packets we have at the crops office, and you can kind of see the process of how you would figure out what to plant. So this lettuce I have on the far left is a long growing lettuce. It's going to take 60 to 70 days to be harvestable. So knowing that our first frost is sometime in October, and even with my season extension methods, I probably won't choose that variety. But there's other things, um, even within the lettuce family, that take much less time. So that's where I'm going to emphasize my planting for the fall. And that it just goes to show that like not only do plants have drastically different, um, or varieties have drastically different um, growing dates, like a tomato versus lettuce, but even within a single variety, there's a lot of variation in how quickly those things mature. If you do want to try to extend your season, especially your greens, into the winter, uh, you can do things like cold frames or row cover. So the cold frame is kind of the top picture I have there. Uh, you can either build one out of more permanent materials like wood, or you can use something organic um, like hay or straw bales, and that'll break down over time, but you're really just creating a little microclimate by the, putting that window on the top so it still gets sunlight, but you're kind of creating an insulation so that the plants can still continue to grow at a slightly more favorable climate. And row cover, um, this is the picture on the bottom, is obviously a very fancy setup, but I use frost cloth all the time just when a cold snap is coming, so if you have only a light frost, you can um, drape this over your plants without harming them, kind of weigh it down against the Nebraska wind with some bricks or something, 
And that's another way of helping your crops last longer. Uh, there's also a lot of tasks you can be doing in the garden this time of year. So you're, you, one thing I just really want to encourage everyone, whether you have a garden or not, is to really balance um, how much you're taking out of your yard at this time of year. And I'll just share an example from a friend of mine. You know, she really loves fireflies and that's like her favorite thing in the summer is to sit on the porch and watch the fireflies. And she started to see this kind of decline in her population and she didn't really know what was going on. Well, it turned out she was a really, really good, studious um, care, caretaker of her yard. So there was not a leaf left on the ground at the end of the fall, no plant matter sitting around. And so that made for a very tidy lawn, but what it did was it removed habitat that those fireflies overwinter in, especially the fallen leaves. And that's true of all the things that you see in your yard, you know, butterflies, beneficial predators, all those things are living in that matter that's on the ground. And so when you remove everything, you remove habitat. Uh, it all things in balance. So I think the example that comes to mind for me is like a squash or zucchini plant. About this time of year, they're looking pretty ugly. They probably have some powdery mildew on the leaves. There's probably a whole bunch of squash bugs in there. I'm not trying to help diseases or pests over winter. So I will remove that stuff and I'll compost it or take it off site. So it's just a kind of encouraging you don't strip everything down to the bare minimum, but you know, leave some things and then kind of strategically remove stuff as you need to. Uh, healthy soil is a living, breathing thing. There's so many creatures involved and really as gardeners and farmers, we're growing good soil and we hope we get some nice produce out of it. So fall is a great time to kind of test your soil. There's a lot of labs locally that will, you know, you just dig up some samples from around your yard, throw it in a bag, send it off to the lab in the mail, and in a week or two, you'll get a really nice report that kind of lets you know how healthy your soil is and what things you might need to work on. And, you know, you can add compost, you can add amendments in and really set yourself up well for next year. And also keep your soil covered. You don't want bare space in your gardens if you can avoid it. And this is a picture from the Holly Hamlet in Lincoln. It's a wonderful community garden that's not run by us, but a, a great example of how a, a neighborhood has come together. And they are excellent users of cover crops. This is rye that you see in this picture from this spring. So a lot of the ones I have listed on this page are overwinterers. So they will basically grow a little bit if you get them in the ground very soon. And then as it gets too cold, they'll go dormant and then they'll pop up in the spring. And what you're doing is not growing a crop that you're gonna eat, but rather you're building up the soil because you're gonna then put this down. You're either gonna turn the plants into the soil or chop them down and they kind of become a mulch and it builds up your soil with good organic matter and it suppresses weeds. So this is a really nice thing to do to get your garden going as well. This is also a really lovely time of year to do record keeping and planning. So if you have an existing garden, take photos, uh, write down where you planted things. Because when we talk about building that good soil, one of the most important things is crop rotation. You don't wanna put the same plant families in the same places year after year. One, because that means that that particular plant family probably is taking particular nutrients or maybe it's a heavier versus a lighter feeder. So you're taking a lot out of the soil in, in an unbalanced way by putting the same things there all the time. And also, you know, the pests and the disease can find the plants easier, if you will, if you're planting the same family in the same place. So rotation is really critical to good soil health and it's always nice to be dreaming about your garden in the winter and moving forward to spring. Uh, if you're starting a new garden, you can measure things out right now. So you can kind of create your temp template for your map and plan ahead. Uh, and you can also check things like, okay, do I have enough sunlight? Am I getting my eight hours a day for, that my plants are going to need? And for those of you that really don't want to go garden out in the snow, like I'm suggesting with the hay bales, <laughs> but you're not ready to give up on plants, you can grow some things inside. So there are some herbs you can grow on the windowsill. And I would just recommend you find a good sunny place and you think about how drafty your windows are. You don't want to stress out the plants. If you're going to try to grow bigger, more complex vegetables, uh, the biggest thing is that you need to properly fertilize them and you also have to have appropriate lights. So when you start your seeds, if you do that at home in the spring, you can use any old light because that plant's not growing to maturity. So I just use like old shop lights. 
But if you're trying to grow something to maturity, it's going to need the full spectrum of light, which means you're going to need particular grow lights. So do a little bit of research, but it can be a really fun thing to do in the winter to kind of keep the garden energy going. As far as resources to learn more, we did a mowing to growing series this year with the city of Lincoln. So you can check out some short educational videos to help you get started. And again, I really highly recommend your local extension office. They have experts on so many different topics. They'll be glad to help you out. And they're also a space if you're like, okay, I want to preserve some things this year, but I also still just have too much and I don't want it to go to waste. They're accepting um, donations of produce. Uh, you can also take produce to FoodNet. So um, those are great ways to make sure your produce doesn't go to waste and you're able to share that bounty. So with that, I'd love to leave some space for, for more questions. I think I saw a few more come in, but thank you so much. Yeah, actually, I have a really good timely question. Um, do you have suggestions of nonprofits that we can donate extra gardening vegetables and things like that? Yeah, perfect. So I know the extension office has like, they have their own donation garden, Lancaster County Extension. So I believe that there's also a bin in their front lobby where you can take your produce and they'll just get that to their partners in the nonprofit world to make sure it's donated. Um, and FoodNet is a really great, unique resource we have here in Lincoln. They have locations all around the city. That's what we do with the Union Bank and Trust veggie van material that we can't sell. Um, so you can find, find their information on the website and go to just about any of the FoodNet stops before they get started. Drop your stuff off and they'll make sure it goes to people who could really use it. And the veggie van, can you explain that a little bit and then tell us maybe what we could buy through it? Sure. Yeah. So the, the Union Bank and Trust veggie van is a, literally a, a little minivan and we've got a trailer that we can bowl behind it as well, but it's our way of making it to the farmer's markets and selling the produce from our beginning farmers. So this year, um, the, the, the number of public events has certainly changed a lot. I think we're all aware of that, but um, we, we, every week we've been at the F Street Farmer's Market, which just wrapped up for the year. It's a smaller neighborhood market. And we also do pop-ups. So like second Friday out at our office at 11th and B, we usually have our neighbors or some great restaurants and, and the South of Downtown Development Corporation. So they have artists featured and we do a little pop-up stand with our, our produce. So that's a great place to access it. Um, as far as what you can buy, it's, it's whatever our farmers are growing. So um, with our Yazidi farmers, they have really specialized in tomatoes, cucumbers, uh, squash, and okra. So those are some of the most popular ones. I will say it's getting um, towards the end of the season, so you're not going to see the full range of products you would normally see. Um, but there's something different every week, and you can also check out our website and order online if you prefer to do that and just do a pickup. So um, yeah, the variety is constantly changing, but it's really fun and it's, it's the best of the best that our farmers are coming up with every week. Does anybody else have a question for Megan? You're free to unmute yourself and ask or send me a question. Uh, we've just got a few more minutes here. Kelly? That means it's a really good presentation and we've covered everything that anyone was going to ask. <laughs> Is this, that means. I, um, Megan, this was so interesting. In fact, I received a message <laughs> that said, this is so interesting. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, really good stuff. And I, I think that we all learn more. I know I, for one, really want to learn more about CSAs. Admittedly, I'm not much of a gardener, but I do like all the other components. I just don't like to go outside or dig in the dirt, <laughs> but I'll welcome excess produce. I'm not much, I, I, I can can. I love to freeze things. I love to cook with them. So I'm really excited about all these options. And I think that some of our, of the folks that turned in, tuned in today are also. So thank you again. Know that um, 
Oh, somebody else says they really appreciated the information. Thank you for the presentation. So another Thank shout you. out to you. Um, I, I do, I think that we all have a jumping off place and probably learned more um, than we anticipated to. And I know I always come with kind of high expectations. So, so thank you again. Um, Megan did give us lots of information and you got one that is applause. <laughs> and know that she has those websites available for more info. And you can always check in with us if you need a, a repeat on some of that, of, of those resources. Um, again, Megan, Megan McGuffey, Executive Director from Community Crop. We just thank her for her time today. And next week, our presenter will be Wendy Tridle from Organized by Design. And she'll be talking about how to love your space, especially if you're sharing it with, with more than one person and you're using it for more than one purpose. So with that, I think we'll sign off for today. Thanks everyone for joining us and Megan, thank you.